Now, some of us work in a wide range of diseases, and some of us have accepted the challenge and fight a foe, which is cancer. Our next speaker definitely accepted that challenge. Um, Dr. Raymond Dubois joined the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University in December of 2012 as its executive director and leader. An internationally renowned physician scientist, he's an internationally known for research in advancing and understanding of the molecular basis for the prevention of colon cancer. He is also the Dalton Chair in ASU School of Health Sciences Solutions with joint appointments in chemistry and biochemistry. In addition, he holds a joint appointment with Mayo Clinic, co-leading their cancer prevention program. Um, Dr. Dubois came to ASU from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston where he served as provost and executive vice president and professor of cancer biology and cancer medicine. He is also one of the leading people in our community, someone we are so excited to have with us. Please join me in a rousing AZ bio welcome for Dr. Raymond Dubois. Thank you. I think I need a hug for that one. <laughs> Well, thank you for that great uh, introduction. And uh, since moving to Arizona from Texas, we've had a really warm welcome here in the state of Arizona. It's uh, been quite heartwarming. My wife and Lisa are really enjoying our time here. Uh, we've gotten involved in hiking and uh, kayaking and all kinds of things we couldn't really do that much in Houston. So it's been really nice. Uh, what, what I thought I would do uh, this morning, uh, this for lunch, is to talk uh, about the Biodesign Institute, give you a little bit of an introduction about the research that my own laboratory is doing and some of my involvement with uh, commercialization in the past, uh, and then talk about the future uh, of biodesign here in, uh, at ASU and what, what we're planning uh, on going forward. So um, as you heard from Joan, my uh, laboratory uh, research is focused on colon cancer. And some of you may know that uh, people who take uh, aspirin on a regular basis have about a 40 to 50% reduction in their risk for colorectal cancer as well as heart disease. Uh, and we've been studying the mechanisms for this, uh, why this drug has uh, such a beneficial effect. Uh, we've made a lot of progress over the last 25 years, and what we're attempting to do is try to develop a preventive measure that people can take uh, to really reduce their risk of colon cancer before it actually occurs. Some of you may know that uh, over 50% of cancer is preventable now, uh, and this would be through proper screening, uh, lifestyle, and uh, diet, and other uh, modifications. So we really want to push that as hard as possible. And unfortunately, uh, uh, we, we had hoped that that would be adopted by the new health care uh, uh, reform. Uh, and we're pushing hard to get prevention more on the map uh, in the future. Um, so this uh, slide just talks a little bit about uh, some of my early work when I was at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Uh, we developed a technology using insertional mutagenesis that would knock out genes that we could then identify what their function is, uh, and uh, especially for viral growth and tumor suppression. Uh, we uh, founded a company in Nashville called Avatar. Uh, it was subsequently bought out by a company in Atlanta called Xeris, uh, and uh, in, currently there are several products under development through the work that we did. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed hearing from the, the, the last speaker about the rodent uh, control because uh, we really focused on that exit strategy and that, that's a very important thing to do uh, to, to make a, a profit with that commercialization effort. So uh, some of you have asked me why I was attracted to Arizona. One of the reasons is that it is a really uh, great entrepreneurial collaborative environment. Uh, President Crow and I had several conversations before uh, coming to Tempe, and uh, clearly uh, some of his vision is very, very uh, addictive and uh, 
energizing, and I think that really uh, played a huge role in, in attracting me here to work. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's also a wonderful place to live and work, uh, and the environment here is just really uh, something that we're, my wife and I are enjoying greatly. Uh, so one of the most common questions I've gotten from my friends back in Texas and people that I've uh, talked to here in Arizona is, what is biodesign? I'm the executive director for the Biodesign Institute, so what is biodesign? And some of you may have heard about this before because the Institute has been in uh, place for almost 10 years now. Uh, we're celebrating the 10th year anniversary this fall. So essentially, it's based on some sort of bio-inspired innovation. Uh, and as we all know, nature has a way of dealing with uh, developing solutions to many problems that it has, a fa it has faced over a long period of time. And I think we can learn more uh, from nature in terms of uh, how it solves some of the biological problems, some of the disease-related problems, and then take that forward to some sort of application or commercialization uh, of a product. Uh, I, I want to show you some examples of biodesign uh, that have been developed by others just because you can see how important this approach is and what it can lead to. Uh, this work was just published uh, in, uh, uh, in a, uh, Nature Biotechnology a few weeks ago. Uh, and this group has developed a new suture uh, for uh, surgical uh, and other purposes, uh, and it's based on this parasitic worm technology. So there's a parasitic worm that infects freshwater fish, uh, and it binds to the small intestine using these uh, very sharp spines that you can see here in this diagram. Uh, then these spines swell up in place, and they are very difficult to remove. Uh, so uh, a group developed some technology on a small surface shown here using that same spine technology. Uh, it turns out to be three, oh, sorry about that. I uh, need to go back. It turns out to be three times stronger than staples and causes a lot less tissue damage and scarring from the suturing process. So uh, this uh, technology is now being tested further, but this is a really good example of taking something that occurred in nature and trying to develop a product uh, that can be used uh, for a surgical application. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is from some time ago. George de Menstrel was a Swiss engineer that uh, worked in Switzerland. Uh, he went on uh, hikes in the Swiss Alps with his dog. Uh, one, of, one day he came back home and noticed that his dog was covered with these cuckleburrs. Uh, it was very hard. George had a real hard time getting the cuckleburr out of the dog's fur. And so he started studying the structure of these burrs, and he discovered that they had these sort of curved hooks on the end, uh, and they could interface with those hairs on the dog's coat uh, in a very strong way. So what he did was, after making this observation, he patented the idea for Velcro in uh, 1948 uh, that eventually developed into this product that we use every day in everyday lives that really came from this bio-inspired uh, uh, bio-inspired idea from, from nature. Lastly, just two weeks ago, uh, a new camera, new digital camera technology was developed based on the structure of the uh, insect eye. The, the, uh, as we know, insects have this compound structure, and if you look at, the, uh, at, a, at a cartoon of this, uh, the insect eye is made up of several uh, uh, lenses uh, that converge into this central optic area. So these uh, uh, bioscientists made this, or bioengineers, made a similar type of structure with several lenses on this curved surface. They were all connected through solid state uh, circuitry to a central area. Uh, and this, uh, this camera has very special properties because it can take an image from a 160 degree angle and flatten it into a very high resolution uh, uh, type image. It's actually being developed further for technology for uh, viewing the planet and looking at areas uh, for conservation, sustainability, and those kinds of things. It's also being developed by the military because this type of imaging is much more uh, high resolution and more useful uh, when placed on a drone or some sort of uh, observational aircraft to look at uh, uh, threats in the environment. So here at ASU, uh, we, we are taking this bio-inspired approach as well. Uh, and I just want to talk about some work that Shelley Hadel did 
uh, and was published uh, actually last week in Plus One, which is an online journal. Uh, what Shelley is really interested in is uh, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, uh, especially Staph aureus and E. coli. And if any of you who have uh, read the news or been in the hospital lately, uh, there's a, a really concern about patients getting infected with these antibiotic resistant bacteria because once uh, they became, become resistant to multiple antibiotics, it's very difficult to treat clinically. Uh, what Shelley has found, uh, she's been studying these clays. She's a, uh, she's a microbiologist, uh, among other things, and she's found that certain clays contain meta metallic ions that really work well as antibacterial agents, especially uh, for Staph aureus and the, and the antibiotic-resistant E. coli. So just recently, she discovered uh, that there are certain metallic ions that make up uh, part of the clay uh, structure that are very important in this, and she's trying to use this discovery from something that occurred in nature. And actually, civilizations have used these clays for over 3,000 years in different ways to treat uh, skin infections uh, to try to develop a product that we can use that would kill these antibiotic-resistant uh, bacteria in ways other than uh, the, uh, back, uh, the antibiotics. So just to give you a snapshot of all that's been going on in biodesign, this is a, a snapshot from 2012 uh, to give you some numbers. Uh, right now, uh, we currently are hosting 11 re uh, research centers of excellence in the Institute. Uh, we attract about 45 to million, or we spend about 45 to million uh, dollars annually in research expenditures. Uh, and this comes from monies derived from outside the state of Arizona, so these are all Department of Defense, NIH, and uh, DOD, and other types of grants that we attract. Uh, in order to get that amount of funding, we've, we have to apply for about 180 to $190 million in grant proposals. So we are able to bring in about a third of the, uh, the research applications that we apply for. Um, last year, uh, in 2012, we had 50 annual invention disclosures and patents, and this is about the average that the Institute has been able to uh, manage. Uh, since the inception of the Institute, there have been 12 spin-off companies that have been developed. Uh, many of these uh, have been uh, focused in the uh, local Arizona area. Uh, 200 active research projects are underway within the Institute. Uh, we currently employ about 500 individuals on a day-to-day -day -day basis within the Biodesign Institute. And we were able to attract Arizona's first Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine. Lee Hartwell came from University of Washington in Seattle, and he co-directs our institute, our, our center for uh, health sustainability. We also have attracted four National Academy scientists uh, who lead the center, and uh, th this is, these are very distinguished scientists, uh, and we occupy about 350,000 square, square feet of Lee's certified laboratories. Our focus is really in three areas, and uh, I think Joan alluded to this earlier, and many of the entrepreneurs talked about you really have to develop a focus area. You just can't do everything. Uh, one, of course, is in biomedicine and health solutions. Another is in sustainability related to uh, biofuels and uh, water. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we have a group that's working on biosecurity, trying to develop plat platforms that can detect uh, when people are exposed to biohazards or other uh, terrorist-related agents. So this really is the snapshot of everything that goes on within the Institute. Now, I, don't, I like to use it to sort of explain what we're up, what we're doing, and what our outcomes are. We really try to start with some sort of bio-inspired concept, as I mentioned. Uh, this is, usually comes from some sort of scientific observation. Uh, research is then done to try to understand the mechanism. I think the work that Shelley Hadel did with the antibiotic clay is a good example of that. Uh, clearly, it had been observed in nature that these clays had uh, an, uh, antibacterial uh, effects. Uh, what Shelley uh, was able to discover was what properties within the clay uh, are useful in uh, killing those bacteria, and now uh, we're working to see if we can translate that into some product that would be useful. Uh, the, as I said, the testing and validation usually falls within uh, things like biosecurity, biofuel production, disease prediction. Uh, and then to, to develop this improved outcome for mankind, there needs to be some sort of, usually some sort of engineering phase 
a scale-up phase, and, and then uh, some sort of startup to commercialize the product. So we have a very entrepreneurial culture. Uh, the, this, uh, this comes from uh, President Crow's vision and mission for the institution. Uh, he really wants to use universities as a knowledge enterprise that can be utilized for uh, real world uh, uses. In 2009, we won Arizona's award for excellence in economic development. Uh, as I said, there are about a dozen companies that have spun off. Most are incorporated or, and headquartered in Arizona. And, uh, just uh, in, within the last two weeks, uh, uh, one of our s center directors spun off another company that's uh, even too early to even talk about. So just to give you a snapshot of some of the work that's going on there now in our uh, research centers, uh, uh, ASU was able to attract Josh LeBaire uh, here about three years ago. Josh came from Harvard University and was at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center in Boston. Uh, what Josh is really interested in is developing this platform uh, for early prediction of disease and for uh, uh, accurate diagnosis of disease, and he's really focused on cancer. Uh, many of the people in his group are focused on breast cancer. What Josh has been able to, to do is to obtain a library of all of the cloned genes or expressed genes in humans. Uh, there are about 20,000 genes, so it's a finite number. Uh, he has a library of these in his laboratory, and he can plate these out on these uh, silicon chip surfaces uh, in, with that are d demonstrated by these little dots. Uh, and then using a, so a ribosomal mixture, he can get those genes to express their relative proteins on this chip. And then he screens uh, samples taken from patients, either sera or plasma, to try to see what kind of immunosignature these patients have uh, in, in, in reaction to these, uh, these proteins. He's been able to show that they can uh, take different types of breast cancer patients, uh, get an immunosignature using this platform, and be able to fairly accurately tell what subtype of breast cancer the patient has. So this is still in early development. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. He's uh, uh, using a lot of robotic uh, approaches to, to make this in a high throughput uh, uh, type of technology that can be easily used and, and many samples can be done quickly. But it's very exciting. Uh, there are collaborations that are underway with uh, Tijan, with uh, Mayo Clinic, and with the Banner uh, MD Anderson group. Uh, Hao Yan uh, is one of our uh, outstanding scientist uh, at uh, Biodesign, and Hal has developed this whole new uh, nanotechnology that uses DNA as the scaffold for the nanostructure that he builds. Uh, he's uh, been able to, by programming the DNA and, and putting in uh, whatever sequence that is required to build these uh, structures, uh, he can, you can see he can build these little flasks, these bowls, uh, and you know, they look uh, really pretty when they're on the cover of the, of the magazine, but they can also be used to deliver drugs, they can be used to, to, to have a biological computers that could be used to, to, to do a, a, what we call a thernostic device, a diagnostic and a, and a treatment uh, all in one uh, type of nanostructure. He's continuing to develop these uh, and developing these, modeling these 3D shapes on, on the microscopic scale. He's doing some real uh, groundbreaking basic science, but eventually uh, the commercial implications from these are to develop smaller electronics and optimally uh, delivered therapies using these nanostructures. His next phase, uh, he wants to go into what we're calling angstrom technology, which is even uh, smaller than nanotechnology that can be used uh, for other, uh, making catalytic uh, engines and other things. Roy Curtis leads our Center for uh, Infectious Disease and Vaccine Technology. Roy is working on many different projects. Uh, this is one where he's developing a salmonella uh, delivery system uh, for a vaccine that he makes the salmonella disease free by taking out all of the toxicity genes or pathogenesis genes and then clones in the uh, the, the vaccine. Uh, it's really a Trojan horse-like technology. It goes into the intestine, expresses the vaccine, uh, and then the vaccine gets taken up systemically uh, and uh, can elicit an immune reaction. He's been able to show in poultry and fish that this is a very effective way to deliver vaccines for those animals. The, uh, he's been able to obtain funding from the Gates Foundation 
to, tr to see if this could be developed as a vaccine technology to vaccinate individuals in Africa and other third world countries where there's no refrigeration and no real uh, injectables that can deliver these kinds of vaccines to the population. Uh, uh, as I said, we, we have this center in uh, sensors and biosensors uh, that's led by NJ Tao. Uh, they've developed sensors that can measure all kinds of components of expired air. Uh, and they developed this uh, company that, that called Breezing, or device called Breezing. We actually have a sample of it out at the ASU booth. Uh, it's shown here, it's about the size of a mouse that you would use for your computer. You expire into this thing three times, and it basically measures your metabolic rate in terms of calories consumed per unit time. And it's Bluetooth and act activated, so it uh, sends the data to a handheld device, uh, either an iPhone or a Samsung device. Uh, that then tells you how many calories you're, you're burning per day, uh, and it gives you advice in terms of uh, what your diet should be, what your exercise program should be, if you want to uh, reach a certain target uh, weight gain or weight reduction. Uh, both he and Erica have done some crowdfunding for this idea and concept. That's been very successful. They're now uh, producing these uh, at about 10, 10 units per month. And this is something uh, that's still being studied, but it would be a direct consumer market uh, for this type of product. Uh, they're hoping to uh, get the price down under $100, somewhere in the $40 to $50 range per unit, uh, so that this could be used to assist individuals in their weight control program. Uh, I mentioned biosecurity. Neil Woodbury and Stephen Johnson co-lead uh, this center. What, what they've done is they've developed a new te technology where they can uh, put uh, a series of peptides on a silicon surface uh, and then uh, take samples from individuals that have been exposed to things like anthrax, Ebola, or all of these uh, serious uh, biohazards that uh, terrorists could potentially use uh, if they wanted to uh, take this approach. Uh, and uh, this is, the idea here is develop rapid response to diagnosis and treatment so that you could mobilize antibiotics, vaccines uh, for a small population uh, if that needed to happen. They've been able to show that this technology works extremely well in diagnosing uh, uh, infections like uh, anthrax and others, uh, and they've spun this uh, technology off into a company called HealthTel that's located in Chandler that's actually doing quite well, uh, and they've been able to get additional support uh, for this concept and this idea. They would like to also utilize this as a way to develop a biomarker platform uh, using this immunosignature approach uh, for chronic disease, uh, certain autoimmune diseases, and others. Bruce Rittman uh, came to Tempe from Northwestern University. Bruce is really interested in two things, uh, sorry, uh, clean water and uh, uh, sustainability. So what Bruce has done is develop these, uh, this membrane biofilm re reactor using bacteria uh, that can remove pollutants from contaminated water. Uh, basically, the contaminated water goes through this uh, bioreactor, comes out on the other end uh, with the pollutants removed, using uh, the bacteria sort of as the engine to convert the pollutant into an inert uh, molecule. He's also re-engineered these uh, cyanobacteria. These are bacteria that use sunlight to, to grow. Uh, so he can uh, take out uh, some of the genes that are in these bacteria and put in a set of genes that creates biofuels like jet fuel. So he's, uh, he definitely has been able to successfully show that he can get these cyanobacteria to make jet fuel, and you can extract it from the media uh, that these are, are, are growing in. There are some technical issues with scaling this up, uh, some bioengineering that needs to be worked out, but hopefully this could be a, a new way to develop uh, biofuel, uh, uh, biofuels from, from sunlight, basically. Um, Bruce actually just, as I mentioned earlier, created a new company last week. Uh, it's just sort of rolling out, and we're real excited about uh, him uh, developing that technology that could be used in a commercial way. So that sort of gives you uh, my presentation and what we're all about. I'm happy to answer any questions by email or phone call or whatever. We're really here, uh, and uh, our whole goal is to take this discovery uh, this knowledge that we can develop in the university setting, but it's really important to get it out where it can help mankind in some way. Thank you.